Good afternoon, everyone. And as we wait for more people to log on, I wanted to thank you for joining us today to discuss last week's events at the Capitol, landmark moments in US-Israel relationships on Capitol Hill, and the book, When Rabbis Bless Congress. I'm Rachel Rosen with Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our president, Mark Melman, and our board, our board of co-chairs, Todd Richmond and Ann Lewis, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are staying well and are staying healthy. In just a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Ann Lewis, our board co-chair to introduce our distinguished guest. But first I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. If you like what you hear today, please consider following us, checking us out on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on Instagram. You can sign up for our news and updates on our website, dmfi.org. And if you wanna ask a question, please submit it through the Zoom in interface. There's a Q&A feature where you can submit your question on Zoom. And if you're watching on Facebook Live today, you can type it into the comments box. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ann Lewis, our board co-chair to introduce Howard Mortman. Hello, thank you for joining us today. As you just heard, I'm Ann Lewis. I have the honor of serving as co-chair of the Democratic Majority for Israel, the only organization working to ensure that the Democratic Party continues our strong support for the US-Israel relationship. Now, we had no idea when we began planning today's event of the horrible pains of the Capitol that we saw last week and are still seared in our minds. Now, as we look to the work before us, with a new administration and a new Congress, we appreciate even more that we are joined today by someone with such a unique, deep perspective on history and Capitol Hill. Howard Mortman is communications director for C-SPAN, the privately funded public service providing television coverage for the US Congress. A veteran of Washington DC media organizations he joined C-SPAN in February 2009 after serving at MSNBC, National Journal's Hotline, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, and new media strategies. With all this experience with new media, last year, Howard took to the old and still my favorite, a book. In October 2020, he published his first book, When, Republic, when Rabbis Bless Congress, the great story of Jewish prayers on Capitol Hill. We are so happy to have him with us today. It is my pleasure to turn over the Zoom lens to Howard Mortman. Thank you, Ann. What a very wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who's joined. Um, this is, I, I can't, uh, I have so much appreciation for this opportunity. Uh, as I actually, and as Ann mentioned, what an extraordinary time in the history of Congress right now um, to be talking about uh, prayers. Uh, and the history of, of, of rabbi prayers. A couple really quick housekeeping uh, points on my end. Uh, as Ann mentioned in the introduction, I'm with C-SPAN and I'm the uh, communications director for C-SPAN, uh, essentially the PR person. Um, this is not a part where we are, as you know, from watching, the, uh, from watching us, we are not, uh, uh, we, are, we don't have our own opinions. You know, we are not partisan. Uh, we just show what's happening in the floor of Congress. We let others uh, think for themselves uh, what they make of it. So too, this presentation, this is flat out history. Um, so there's gonna be no opinions from me on what's, hap what's happening. Um, also, I'll add one little coda. Uh, I am Jewish, uh, but this, hopefully this story of prayer in Congress um, is not a Jewish only uh, story that uh, all religions, and I know there are mem uh, your members of many of whom are not, not Jewish, uh, will gain from this and from the understanding. So I just wanna, uh, uh, make those quick points. Um, so nonpartisanship for me and non-denominational for me as well. Second quick, really quick thing, uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. I typically have done this presentation in small audiences like for synagogues and with my younger daughter, 12 uh, year old daughter at my side running it. So I'm doing this alone. My younger daughter is in class right now. Um, it's her presentation she made for me, but I'm uh, gonna be running it. Um, this is gonna be heavy on video. So hopefully all that my, uh, this is on my end, all the, the technology will work and showing some YouTubes. Uh, but let me just get started now. This is, uh, as Ann said, this is the, uh, When Rabbis Bless Congress, the first ever book about rabbis who have prayed uh, in Congress uh, and uh, very few written works in general about the history and tradition of prayers in Congress. I'm gonna open up uh, the next slide in one second with a video um, showing, and you'll see in a moment, um, Senate Chaplain Black, uh, Barry Black, 
uh, typically when I've done this presentation, I give an example of uh, a prayer that's open Congress, uh, the Senate. Uh, what you're about to see is the video of him actually closing uh, Congress last week, last Wednesday, the horrific events that we all saw. And I'm just gonna go right and show you that video now and uh, press play here and hopefully this works. Let us pray. Lord of our lives and sovereign of our beloved nation, we deplore the desecration of the United States Capitol building, the shedding of innocent blood, the loss of life, and the quagmire of dysfunction that threaten our democracy. These tragedies have reminded us that words matter and that the power of life and death is in the tongue. We have been warned that eternal vigilance continues to be freedom's price. Lord, you have helped us remember that we need to see in each other a common humanity that reflects your image. You have strengthened our resolve to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, domestic as well as foreign. Use us to bring healing and unity to our hurting and divided nation and world. Thank you for what you have blessed our lawmakers to accomplish in spite of threats to liberty. Bless and keep us. Drive far from us all wrong desires. Incline our hearts to do your will and guide our feet on the path of peace. And God, bless America. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to hang it there for one second. A couple really quick things. Um, again, you saw, you see right now it's nearly four in the morning when they give this prayer. This is the closing of the session. Uh, typically, prayers are given at the very beginning of each session, uh, even before the Pledge of Allegiance is offered. This is an extraordinarily powerful prayer. Um, and I just wanted to open with that just to make this topical. Uh, but some of the themes are, are general and applicable to all the prayers at Open Congress. You heard him mention God. Uh, often they, they, they cite scripture. Uh, but this is, uh, you heard there from uh, Barry Black, retired ad, uh, Navy Admiral, uh, who is the chaplain of the Senate. The House, uh, her name, uh, she's brand new, uh, 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 Chaplain Kibben, also retired uh, Navy chaplain. For the first time now, both uh, houses, both chambers have retired admirals uh, as their official chaplains. Um, she is um, Presbyterian and he is Seventh-day Adventist. So that's just kind of the scene setter. That's a prayer in Congress. Um, um, one second, I'm gonna, all right. A quick history of prayers in Congress. Just again, setting the scene, uh, it goes back to the very beginning. Uh, the Continental Congress opened with a prayer. Uh, during the Constitutional Convention, uh, Benjamin Franklin advocated prayers. And if you see in the timeline here, uh, the Senate and the House both elected chaplains uh, in Congress before even the Bill of Rights uh, was, was approved. So this goes back to the very beginning of our country. Guest chaplains, and this is kind of where our story begins, guest chaplains began as a tradition in the 1850s. Um, guest chaplains is where, that's, that's the premise for my book and my project, is when the official chaplain is not uh, in the chamber and is not giving the prayer, uh, there's a substitute, a substitute host as it were. Um, it could be that the chaplain um, is out or doing other business 
uh, or in many ways, the role of the guest chaplain is to show uh, the prevalence of diversity of religion in our country. And by offering the opportunity for others to pray, you, you demonstrate um, all the different religions that America uh, benefits from. The first rabbi guest chaplain was in 1860 and his name, Rabbi Morris Raphael. Uh, his prayer, February 1st, 1860, as you all know from your history, uh, Abraham Lincoln was not president yet. It was James B. Cannon. Uh, his first prayer was on the eve of the Civil War. And you see, this is, uh, and as we talk more about this, uh, you, you kind of get the sense of history uh, over Congress. And uh, he talks about brethren dwelling together in unity. Uh, later on in the prayer, it's a very lengthy prayer. You don't see the prayers this long anymore. Here's uh, from the old congressional record, Congressional Globe back then, kind of some of the text. Uh, but he just talks about some of the foreboding and the fear about uh, America about to be uh, uh, torn apart. Rabbi Raphael, born in Sweden, uh, he uh, from uh, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in New York City, but he was the first rabbi to pray in Congress in 1860. He was quite a shock, by the way, the New York Times um, almost mocked him, talking about how he dressed in his costume uh, and other members of Congress uh, were shocked as well uh, to see that. Um, I'm gonna pray now, uh, I'm gonna show now a prayer. Um, I'm gonna fast forward the timeline a lot uh, and let's go to the Senate, uh, May 23rd, 2013. And some of you may know this name. Uh, the reason I picked him, Rabbi Michael Beals, uh, is he's from Delaware and I'm gonna put up, uh, show his prayer. He's very close, I believe, to um, um, President-elect Biden. And so you might hear more from him in, uh, in the years ahead. But here's uh, Michael Beals, rabbi from Congregation Beth Shalom. Today's opening prayer will be offered by Rabbi Michael Beals, rabbi at Congregation Beth Shalom in Wilmington, Delaware. Let us join together in prayer. Rabbona Allah, master of the universe. We said our first prayer to the residents of Moore, Oklahoma, may be your will that those who are missing be found alive and be cared for. Send comfort to those who have suffered loss and with the help of those gathered here, send the resources required to rebuild. Eternal our God, you commanded us to care for the widow, the orphan, and you commanded us to care for, so appropriate today, the stranger in our midst. Thank you for giving our nation these esteemed United States senators to help us as a nation fulfill the command to care for the most vulnerable in our midst. And to each of these honorable United States senators, you have implanted your divine spark. Help these senators, your humble servants, find a way of working together for the common good. In doing so, may they thus take their individual holy inner light and join them together, creating one unified shaft of light so strong that it will shine clear up to the firmament above. We pray this in your sacred and holy name, and let us all say, Amen. Okay, uh, one really quick thing about that. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, not only was it a classic prayer, but he mentioned a very topical thing that maybe everybody's since long forgotten, a uh, more Oklahoma, there's a tornado. Um, and, and so he mentioned uh, that at the beginning. Um, you may not remember the tornado, but what's interesting is that many of these rabbis who have prayed in Congress uh, incorporate current events or a, that day in history as a, um, aspect of the prayer as a kind of a jumping off point uh, to connecting the prayer uh, to the moment in history. Um, so that's Rabbi Michael Beals of Delaware. Um, Today's opening prayer one, will be offered by... Okay. All right. Now let's quickly get to the numbers. I'm sure everybody's curious, well, how many times has this happened? Um, there have been 634 times that a rabbi has opened Congress in prayer. Uh, and that goes from the first one we saw Rabbi Morris Raphael in 1860 to the most current one uh, in October, 2020. And uh, uh, that represents 441 rabbis. Now, if you do your quick math, you see those numbers are different. Why is 634 times rabbis open Congress of prayer, but only 441 rabbis? 
Great question, everybody. That's because many of these rabbis, about 100 of them, have opened Congress more than one time. So there have been a lot of repeat uh, guest, uh, performers who have come back and prayed in Congress multiple times. Um, one quick note, uh, historical note, for the past year, uh, there are only, um, uh, because of COVID, uh, the number of guest chaplains as a whole in Congress um, dwindled. And only about 10 or so guest chaplains as a whole prayed, at least in the, uh, the House of Representatives. And of uh, that number, only one was a rabbi. We'll get to him in a moment, Rabbi Arnold Reznikoff. Um, so 441 rabbis have prayed 634 times. Um, one second here. Um, another question you probably have is, well, which synagogue, the greatest representation? Now, uh, 24 times a rabbi has opened Congress in prayer from Washington Hebrew congregation. I have to say one quick uh, uh, housekeeping note that thanks to Washington Hebrew congregation, they actually partnered uh, in my book. Uh, and, um, and which kind of makes sense because they've had the best every senior rabbi of uh, Washington Hebrew congregation going back to their first one in 1872 has opened Congress in prayer. And that leads up even to the current days in 2019, uh, what Rabbi Bruce Lustig of Washington Hebrew congregation uh, gave the house prayer. Uh, second place, B'nai Jeshurun, eight rabbis or eight prayers from rabbis. And seventh, uh, third place, Addis Israel congregation. I brought here, uh, you see from the congressional record uh, from Addis Israel, Rabbi Solomon Metz, uh, gave a prayer on the eve of D-Day. And his prayer, you can almost, again, one of these things I love about this project is kind of imagining yourself, what, what would it be like to be in the chamber with the foreboding and you know the, and what's happening the next day with D-Day? But he gave the prayer right before D-Day. It just talks about uh, you know victory. And you see there, the, uh, quoting Micah um, at the end. So big part of history is swept up in this. No question, uh, the two in first, second, and third place are Washington, D.C. congregations. That's because of the obvious geography. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, now, who's prayed the most? Everybody wants to know the, that number. Well, Rabbi Arnold Reznikoff, uh, 17 prayers uh, in Congress, eight in the Senate, nine in the House. He actually gave, as I mentioned, the most recent prayer in, in the House of Representatives, October uh, 2020. And he's a... Um, we're going to show a little video of him in a moment. Uh, he retired, Navy chaplain, fought in Vietnam, uh, was in Beirut um, in 1983 for the, uh, um, the bombing of the Marine barracks. He also gave the invocation uh, when the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial was dedicated in 1982. Uh, but he's given the most of 17, and he was also affiliated with Addis Israel. Second place, Rabbi Moshe Feller, and there's a picture of him there, uh, Lubavitcher from Minnesota. Uh, and has given wonderful prayers in, the, in Congress, nine total, eight in the Senate, one in the House. Uh, third place, Rabbi Arthur Schneier, uh, Holocaust survivor, uh, two prayers in the Senate, five prayers in the House. And in fourth place, uh, he's since passed away, but Rabbi Joshua Haberman, uh, who escaped uh, from the Holocaust from born in Austria. And you see a picture of him there in the Senate. He actually is the earliest uh, rabbi I have on video. He gave this, this prayer, the first, um, the earliest prayer I have in video through the C-SPAN archives, 1985 uh, from Washington Hebrew Congregation. And I like, the, I, it's a great video because he's introduced by Tip O'Neill uh, in the video. So a neat bit of history there. Um, I love uh, talking about this, denominations. A lot of people want to know, well, conservative Orthodox reform, basically it breaks down in equal and rough equal parts. 35% uh, of the rabbis who have prayed have been Orthodox. And I include uh, Lubavitchers uh, in that category. 34% reform uh, and 30% conservative, roughly, roughly here, a third, a third, a third. Um, I like talking about this because it brings out an important point that there's no quotas. There's no one dictating. The government isn't dictating or anybody else saying how many have to be of a certain denomination. Uh, this naturally occurs. This is organic. This is how, uh, as a result of, of a century and a half, of, uh, since 1860, of uh, prayers from rabbis have kind of equally fallen out. Uh, first rabbi, who was a woman, some of you who know your Jewish history may know, have heard of the name Rabbi Sally Prezand. Sally Prezand was the first ordained uh, female rabbi in America, 1972. Uh, a year later, she showed up in Congress and gave the prayer uh, in front of the House of Representatives on October 23, 1973. Uh, I liked uh, pointing her out for a couple of reasons. She actually talked about being topical. She uh, gave the prayer on the day that the House of Representatives uh, uh, 
was considering the impeachment proceedings against Nixon and voted for the House Judiciary Committee uh, to uh, begin the proceedings. She gave the prayer that day. Uh, she was sponsored that day by uh, uh, a member of the House, I'm sure a lot of you remember, uh, Bella Abzug, uh, a sponsor of Rabbi Sally Prezan that day. Uh, this was in the early 70s when a lot of first time uh, uh, moments were made, uh, milestones for women. Uh, and so she was the first uh, woman rabbi. Now, one little sad uh, uh, coda to the story, um, you see that, you see her name. Now, in my slide, I correctly uh, write it, her spelling of her last name is P-R-I-E-S-A-N-D. The congressional record gets her name wrong. Uh, you see here, they got her name wrong as P-R-E-I-S-A-N-D, which makes it tough to find among other ignominies of that. Uh, she is one of only two rabbis the other one being male, who was, uh, whose names were misspelled in the Russian record, uh, but it does make it tougher to find in there. How many female rabbis? Uh, 15 prayers by 14 women, uh, have, have, uh, including Rabbi Prezian. Uh, here's a, a look at some of them. I'm going to play a prayer now. Uh, by the way, in the bottom right, Rabbi Hannah Spiro, the most recent uh, female rabbi, has given the prayer twice in the house from Hill Havara. Uh, she's the only woman to have given the prayer uh, twice. And I'm going to play for you now. Um, some of you may know her, you're, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, you may recognize the last name. Um, so let's play this from the Senate, April 20th, 1994. Today's prayer will be offered by a guest chaplain, Rabbi Dina A. Feingold of Beth Hillel Temple, Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, who is also the sister of the junior senator from Wisconsin. Let us pray. Source of wisdom, well of justice, fountain of goodness and of peace. We praise you for pouring your spirit upon humanity as we struggle feebly to fashion our society into the kind of world you have envisioned. We cherish your guidance as we strive to bring peace, harmony and equity to this world in which we are your partners. As these elected officials begin another day of deliberation in the United States Senate, we pray that your presence may dwell among them. Enable them to discern and to acquire but a minute portion of your wisdom and compassion, your knowledge of what is just and right as they carry out the awesome task of governing our great nation. Grant them insight and endurance as they consider the weighty issues facing our country. Endow them with deep concern for one another, for their constituents, for the people of this nation and indeed of the entire world. Give them courage to take the difficult stands and to ask the hard questions which must be asked in order to bring wholeness to our broken world. With grateful hearts do we stand before you, framer and fashioner of all that is right and just, for the privilege of living in this land of freedom, where the spirit of goodness is felt keenly by so many. Eternal power of the universe, author of freedom, to you we offer thanks and praise, and let us say, Amen. Okay, you recognize the city, obviously, from current events, Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I'm sure you all recognize the last name, Feingold, introduced by her brother, uh, Russ Feingold, uh, in that prayer. Today's prayer will be offered by a guest on, chaplain. So hold on a second. Hold on Rabbi D. All right. Um, um, another type of rabbi who's prayed, uh, military chaplains. And I actually love talking about this uh, for a moment here. 55 uh, rabbis who served in the military as a chaplain or some other capacity have prayed in Congress, have opened Congress in prayer. Here are uh, pictures of four of them um, uh, who actually showed up in their military uniforms. Um, some of you may know Rabbi Stephen Ryan of uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, he is the rabbi at the Congregation of Gudas Achim in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, you see a Navy rabbi, you see rabbi, on the bottom right, Rabbi Arnold, uh, I'm sorry, Harold Robinson of the Navy. Uh, Kenneth Leinwand of uh, the Army uh, have given her prayers. 
Um, moving on, the, um, uh, where do the rabbis come from? In addition to being native born Americans, uh, 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 the story of rabbis who appeared in Congress is a great uh, testament to immigration and the story of uh, immigration in the Jewish experience. 26 prayers uh, from Poland, uh, rabbis from Poland, delivered by 19 rabbis, uh, and 24 prayers delivered uh, by 16 rabbis from Germany and then Austria and Hungary, uh, Holocaust survivors. So here we get into a big part of the story of, of an amazing part of this is rabbis who, uh, or Jews who fled from Europe, either survived the Holocaust or fled before the Holocaust, came to America, became rabbis and ended up praying in the literal center of democracy here. Uh, Holocaust survivors. Uh, here are a couple uh, rabbis who have uh, prayed in Congress who survived the Holocaust. And actually six rabbis uh, were, uh, believe it or not, survivors of Auschwitz. Uh, they came to America, became rabbis. Uh, and on the bottom right, uh, it's actually on a personal note, Rabbi Laszlo Berkowitz uh, was an Auschwitz survivor. Uh, Rabbi Berkowitz is actually from my synagogue, uh, Temple Road of Shalom in Falls Church, Virginia. He died a month ago, uh, very sadly, but he was the founding rabbi of Road of Shalom. But he uh, prayed in Congress on June 14th, 1988, uh, Flag Day, and gave the prayer. And in his prayer, Frank Wolf uh, uh, sponsored him, talked about the 82nd Airborne rescuing him from, from Auschwitz. Uh, quickly, um, what, are the, what are the rules for being a guest chaplain? Here, some of them, you can't exceed 150 words, um, given exclusively in English. You see here, that's kind of, I think, a newer rule because a lot of times some of the older prayers, a lot of Hebrew uh, has been incorporated. Uh, free, and this is a big one, free of personal political views. They're not there to lobby. They're there to, or to talk about current legislation. Yes, they incorporate history and big moments uh, in their prayers of what's happening but this is not uh, time to be pushing or debating uh, for legislation. Rabbis and the content of what they've talked about, they've talked about big issues, war and peace, diversity, the civil rights movement, space. A lot of them have uh, given prayers in the time of the space program when astronauts have gone to the moon or the space shuttle and they've, they've incorporated uh, those themes in their prayers. Uh, the bottom, American institutions, Congress, the government, Liberty Bell, uh, uh, as, uh, citing from Leviticus has been a big part of their prayers. Um, so again, big, big themes. Isaiah is the most commonly cited of uh, 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 Jewish uh, historical figures and prayers. Uh, 75, 70 rabbi prayers have, have mentioned Isaiah and the big winner is, many of you know Isaiah 2.4, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore, has been cited 70 times. Um, one of the joys of doing this research, discovering Hebrew in the congressional record uh, when rabbis have spoken prayers. And you see, uh, for some reason, there's, and I don't know why, a lot of them occurred in the 60s, but there's examples of rabbi uh, guest chaplains who have spoken Hebrew. The Hebrew then shows up in the congressional record and even the transliteration there. So here are uh, four examples of that happening. Um, you know what? I'm going to skip this video because of time. Um, um, rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, famous British rabbi, passed away last year as well, gave the prayer um, in 2011. It's a beautiful prayer. He was sponsored by Joe Lieberman, uh, and I apologize for, because of time. I want to uh, get to some other stuff, but um, um, let me um, fast forward. You know, uh, Actually, you know what? Let me just do a little bit of Sachs here, just give you a flavor. It's a quick prayer. said it will come to order. Today's opening prayer will be offered by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, London, England. Sovereign of the universe, who created all in love, teach us to love all that is good and beautiful in this world. Teach us to honor the dignity of difference recognizing that one who is not in our image is nonetheless in your image, never forgetting that the people not like us are still people like us. At this fateful moment in the human story, bless us that we may be a blessing to others. Guide the nations of the world to honor you by honoring one another, so that by reaching out in love, we may turn enemies into friends and become your family on earth as you are our parent 
in heaven. Beloved God, bless the members of this United States Congress and guide their deliberations, that they may govern this great nation with wisdom and justice, grace and compassion, bringing honor to your name and your blessing to humankind. Amen. Okay, really quick. I love this prayer for a couple of reasons. It's brief. Uh, minute. I see it's a minute 40 clocks in at uh, foreign rabbi, um, you know, from Britain. He's a br he was, he passed away in 2020, brilliant uh, rabbi. And a timeless message here, you know, what he said uh, can be given today and still have as much power as you heard. Um, I'm not going to, for time, I'm not going to play Joe Lieberman sponsored him that day. Um, and the last I'm going to show this. Actually, for time, I'm going to speak for itself here. Only to say this prayer is from Rabbi Reznikov, December 31st, uh, right after the attacks in the synagogue in Monse, New York. Uh, a lot of rabbis have made news by showing up in Congress in the local papers. Rabbi Reznikov made news, uh, national news for the first time for a rabbi on national TV. So let's, let's play. 2019 winds down a prayer this morning on Capitol Hill from a rabbi marking the end of the year with a message of hope. With this decade's last house prayer, we give thanks for progress. Look ahead with hope, but with eyes wide open to prejudice, hatred, terror that remain fueling violence like the anti-Semitic Hanukkah party attack Saturday, the Texas church attack Sunday. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. And let us say, Amen. Thank you. Okay, by the way, the music they heard underlying that is not Army, is not C Spain, that's CNN's music you heard there. Um, so uh, I'm going to. 2019 winds down a prayer here. this time by. All right. Uh, I'm, I don't have time for this. This is a great one. Uh, I can, if anybody wants to see this later, this is uh, members of Congress who sponsor rabbis getting the Hebrew wrong and having a tough time and fumbling over the uh, pronunciation. It's a fun video. Uh, but because of time, I do want to get to a couple other order. things here really fast. Um, I want to switch gears really abruptly here. And uh, that's the end of the presentation about the book and the project. The event organizers asked me to put together, and you saw in the promotion, talking about um, some video clips of, um, of um, uh, President Mike Biden talking about Israel and also uh, um, the floor of Congress talking about Israel. Uh, and I actually, uh, I, I love doing this because it gives me a chance to show and to put a plug in for the C-SPAN video archive. So I'm going to show, next thing I'm going to show, really change of gears here, uh, a montage video of some of those themes all taken from C-SPAN video. Um, so I urge everybody uh, to use our archives to do your own research um, and find moments that you want from our coverage of the floor of Congress. So let me just play that right now and it'll speak for itself. If you were a Jew, if I were a Jew, I would be a Zionist. As a matter of fact, I don't, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. As most of us do, Israel and this body, we're apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made, none. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interests in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. I am with my colleagues who are on the floor of the Foreign Relations Committee, and we worry at length about NATO. And we worry about the eastern flank of NATO, Greece and Turkey, and how important it is. They pale by comparison. Mr. President, it is unconscionable for us to refuse to recognize the right of the Jewish people to choose their own capital. What gives us that right to second guess their decision? For 47 years, we and much of the rest of the international community have been living a lie. For 47 years, Israel has had its government offices, its parliament, and its national monuments in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv. And yet nearly all embassies are located in Tel Aviv. I think this is a denial of fundamental reality. Mr. President, are we, through the continued sham of maintaining our Israel in Tel Aviv, to refuse to acknowledge what the Jewish people know in their hearts to be true? 
regardless of what others may think. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. A big deal election. And what you have done, what you have outlined, what you have fought for, and just look at your own publication, they're taking stands on the issues, whether or not you are talking about U.S. leadership in the world and the need for us to be internationalist and not isolationist, whether or not you're talking about Israel in the Middle East and us remaining reliable ally of Israel and understanding Israel must make its own decision. Israel must make its own decision. You know, they tell in Southern Delaware a joke that's inappropriate on his face to tell to a Jew Jewish audience. They tell the joke about the chicken and the pig who will want to celebrate Farmer Brown's birthday. And they say, we're going to do something special for Farmer Brown. He's been a great farmer for us. And they're walking through the barnyard. And the chicken says to the pig, what do you have in mind? The chicken says, let's give him a ham and egg breakfast. And the pig looks at the chicken and says, for you, it's a contribution. For me, it's a total commitment. <laughs> Well, for Israel, we can have all the views we want, all the views we want. But for Israel, when they take a chance, it's a total commitment. For us, for us, it's a contribution. My first trip as a senator abroad was to meet with a woman I admired and was more excited to meet than anyone. The only two people, only other person I was this excited to meet was Nelson Mandela. It was Golda Meir. I went over as a young senator in 1973. The Egyptians, because I think they thought I was young and didn't know anything, let me be the first American to fly into Cairo and get in an automobile and drive to the Suez Canal, which they had occupied. They had closed. And after that, I went to meet with Golda Meir. And I sat in for many of you have been in her office, the prime minister's office, those, those blonde double doors, you walk in a relatively small desk and behind the desk, Golda had all these maps. She loved to flip the maps up and down while she chain smoked. And I sat there for several, I don't know how long, but a long time. And sitting next to me was a guy that really impressed me first by his silence and second when he spoke by the depth of what he had to say. And the guy's name was Rabin. He was then in the army. That's how I started my first hand. You remember, Norman, my first hand education about Israel, the first time I had been there. I have known every single prime minister and most of them very well since that time, nine since Golden. Tonight is about miracles. The miracle of courageous warriors overcoming great odds to preserve the culture the identity and the freedom of a people. A miracle of rededicated temple flame burning for eight nights when there was only enough oil for one. The miracle that sustained a faith and a community through times of tragedy. That thousand years later, Judaism was alive and well in its many vibrant communities and denominations that the people that the people of israel live on as a result generations of israelis and americans and american israelis have kept a foot in each country enriching both our nations and our peoples i met with some of your leading high-tech leaders uh, earlier prior to uh, coming to the stage they have a foot in both countries, many of them. All these close relationships span the realm of commerce and education, medicine and technology, culture and the arts. At its core is an ironclad commitment to security, Israel and my own countries. Sustaining, sustaining our ironclad commitments to Israel, security, regardless of how much you may disagree with this present leader. It is essential. Indeed, we both experienced recent elections and the peaceful transition of power. And I want to congratulate my friend, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and as they say in the Senate, he is my friend, for his victory. Bibi and I have been friends for a long, long time. I'm too long to mention. And you know the old cliche, imitation 
is the sincerest form of flattery. Well, I looked at Likud's website, campaign website, and on behalf of the Obama Biden administration, I must say I am flattered. <laughs> Take a look at the website. It looked like you're running co-joined campaigns here. When you consider that no other people on this planet have been identified so closely with any city as the people of Israel are with Jerusalem, a city which this year celebrates the 3,000th yeah. anniversary of King David declaring it his capital. No Jewish religious ceremony is complete without mention of the holy city. And twice a year at the conclusion of the Passover Seder and the Day of Atonement services, all assembled repeat one of mankind's oldest and shortest prayers next year in Jerusalem. Providing Israel with additional missile defense funding could deter Israel's foes from launching an attack and help prevent conflict. The goal of my bill, bill is to preserve the peace and to ensure that Israel prevails if its enemies choose the path of war. I rise today to introduce the United States-Israel Agriculture Strategic Partnership Act, H.R. 2659 a bipartisan bill that permanently authorizes the U.S.-Israel Binational Agriculture Research and Development Program, otherwise known as BARB, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. I want to thank my co-introducer, Congressman Yoho, as well as you, Mr. Speaker, for being a co-sponsor and many others in the Florida delegation. I could wax ecstatic and poetic about BARB, but let me just say this. The program works. The goals of BDS are clear, just read their words. Israel shall not, it cannot yield, and we in the United States must stand with our ally that shares our values and has always worked with us. I rise today with so many of my colleagues to not only reaffirm our friendship with the state of Israel, but to express my deep appreciation for it. Our two countries share an unbreakable commitment to the democratic ideals of individual, religious, and economic freedom. Israel stands as a beacon of democracy in a region characterized by political repression. And for that, she should be honored and protected. Our friendship with Israel should not be a political talking point. Okay. Rachel, I apologize. I broke a iron rule of TV. I went over and I apologize for not hitting my mark there. But I'm you, going to. Uh, I would you, I would be as. Let's see. I need. Um, one quick housekeeping note on that. Again, video taken from the C-SPAN video library. Uh, both parties, uh, I'm a C-SPAN guy, so I just want to make that clear. But I urge everybody at your convenience to check out our, our video and find whatever you want. Uh, Rachel, I throw it back to you, but I think I stopped sharing at this point, if I'm not mistaken. So, okay. That'd be great. Okay. That, was, that was fantastic, Howard. That was really wonderful. And I wanted to uh, ask people to submit questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom, or if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the comment section. We're gonna turn to the Q&A portion of the program now. But before we get started there, I also wanna acknowledge, um, I understand that there's a bunch of rabbis on our call today. So we're, we're grateful to have them. I know that Rabbi Arnold Resnikoff, whom we heard from a little bit earlier is on the call, and our board co-chair, Todd Richmond, mentioned to me that his rabbi, Rabbi Stanger, uh, is also on the call. So thank you very much to everyone. So please go ahead and submit your questions. Uh, Howard, one I wanted to start with uh, from uh, Susan, Susan Wagner is, could you explain the process to get approved as a chaplain to be able to speak in Congress? Absolutely. So that's the, the question. How do you, uh, and I get this question from rabbis who might be a little embarrassed, like, how do I get to do this? If basically, the most common way, it's not every case, you are sponsored by a member of Congress, uh, a senator or your local representatives. Typically, it is connected locally. So the member who represents that rabbi be, uh, is the one who's, who puts forward and recommends uh, that uh, his or her constituent rabbi pray. These aren't donors. You know, this isn't, you know, you're, you're praying, you're not paying uh, your way to Congress, uh, but it's some learned member of the community. But typically, it is through your local congressman not always. There are exceptions. Exceptions could be uh, in a pro forma session uh, when there's when uh, Congress is in for a couple of minutes. Rabbi Resnikov was on this. Is in the meeting now. Has done a couple of pro forma sessions. 
uh, virtue of just the geography you, you are around. He's from DC, but he's also earned his way. But for the most part, it is a connection somehow. Now, not every member of Congress sponsors a rabbi from his community. Uh, there are rabbis from different states, uh, I'm sorry, members of Congress from different states who are friends uh, with a rabbi from a different state who sponsors uh, him or her as a guest chaplain. Great. That's good, good to know. I wanted to ask about uh, Chaplain Black's uh, remarks that you, you showed, I think it was the first clip we, we watched. After the events at the Capitol last week, do you think, do you think business as usual in the Capitol is forever altered? Well, I, um, not being a pundit, I will say uh, uh, within, it seems that way to, in terms of the news coverage. Uh, if I could limit in terms of, of, of the prayers, they've become a lot more, I mean, it's been a week now. Um, you know, their brand new chaplain for the house, uh, 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 Chaplain Kibben, I mean, every day she's given a prayer that's been, you know, uh, articles of impeachment talked about a 25th Amendment. So the news itself drives a lot of the, uh, uh, the greater scrutiny or disattention uh, to this narrow area of prayers. As a C-SPAN guy, absolutely. Uh, just in terms of what we do, I mean, every, I mean everybody's in some way mourning or grieving or, or reflecting in their own ways. Uh, we all do this in different ways, but it is a re it'll probably be a long recovery period. And Howard, let me ask you a question from Jonathan Skolnick. I think he's trying to get it. So the percentage of rabbis who've blessed Congress versus chaplains and, and people from, from other religions. Uh, and Jonathan asks, 634 rabbi-led prayers out of how many total prayers since 1860? If there are, say, 300 prayers a year over 150 years, then rabbi-led prayers are about one and a half percent. Is that a ballpark? Perfect. I, love, I actually love that question because I want to put this in perspective. I wrote a book about this. I did a project. I did research on this. Um, it's cherry picking. I mean, it, this is picking out rabbis to tell their story, what they, who they are and what they said. Uh, by no means am I trying to overinflate um, the prevalence of rabbis. Rabbis aren't praying in Congress every single day. Uh, this is still a predominantly Christian nation, non-Jewish nation. There are guest chaplains from other religions who have prayed Islam, uh, Hindu uh, rabbis have, uh, uh, um, members of the cloth have prayed as well. Uh, predominantly, most prayers are non-Jewish or obviously Christian. Uh, a study showed, and this isn't my study, um, uh, a 15 year period, I believe from 2000 through 2015, uh, counted up uh, guest chaplains and found that 95% of the guest chaplains were not were, were Christian, 3% were Jewish. So in a way, Jews in terms of the population may be a little overrepresented represented, uh, in how many times they pray. Uh, but it's still reflective of the small numbers. So, yeah, so this is a story about prayer, about rabbis who have prayed, but in no means am I trying to come off as, as saying this is happening all the time. It's not. Uh, my point is that it's a fascinating story to learn about uh, the sliver of Jewish history uh, and Congress history of the rabbis who have prayed. Great. We have a question from, from Paulette. To what extent do the to what extent do the rabbi's blessings actually get heard? It looked like some of the rooms were fairly empty. Are the blessings rebroadcast? If so, when and where? I imagine you may tell us that we can see some of them uh, by watching your network. Yeah, so I, thank you. These are wonderful questions, by the way. I particularly love this question because you're totally right. Uh, the, the chambers are empty. Uh, the first thing Congress does every day is pray before they do the Pledge of Allegiance. So just in terms of the mechanics of getting members in the chamber, they are not all there. Um, the pre, uh, and to bring in where I work, C-SPAN into this, we broadcast it. So we are essentially broadcasting a national a prayer to a national TV audience every day. Um, the greatest way I can answer that is actually, I'm gonna cite somebody who has been a guest chaplain 30 or 40 times, who's not Jewish, he's not a rabbi, uh, but I have become a friend of uh, through working on this project. His name is Pastor Dan Cummins. And Pastor Cummins has opened Congress and prayer a lot, particularly during pro forma sessions. He told me, he's become a friend of mine to this and I love it, but he told me he's actually doesn't care how many people are in the room. His audience are the people beyond, the, uh, the, the audience that's beyond outside the chamber. And as you mentioned, Rachel, the video that lives on in our archives. So he's, this Pastor Cummins is keenly interested in how many people watch his prayer on YouTube or through the C-SPAN video library couldn't really care how many people are actually sitting in the chamber because even though it's geared for the members of the house 
or the Senate, uh, those aren't always the ones who are listening. And Howard, I think we have time for, for one final question. I don't know uh, if many of the people listening uh, to us today are, are active on Twitter, but, but Howard is, and he is, a, he is a very popular account there. And I think part of that popularity stems from him finding obscure political clips uh, from C-SPAN that he shares. So Howard, I was hoping maybe you could tell us about how you've uh, observed the, the media landscape and maybe even the social media landscape changing over the 10 years or so or more that you've been at C-SPAN. Sure, thank you so much for that, Rachel. And in fact, I will tie that into a little bit about the book. Um, uh, I love history. I'm, I'm, um, well, what I'm not, I'm not a professional historian. I'm not a rabbi. Uh, I flunked out of religious school. It's like all the things I'm talking about today is just it's just me being interested in this topic. Um, I'm intrigued, you know, having, as you mentioned, I've watched a lot of Congress uh, for a living. Uh, I've watched the House and the Senate all day long. And I just was always intrigued by the prayers that begin each session. Being Jewish, I was even more intrigued when a rabbi would show up. So this is very much just a passion project. Um, one of the beauties and the joys of doing this is the archived video. And you mentioned that I do like to share historical clips, maintaining the patina of C-SPAN that we don't uh, have our own opinions, but you know, you could in many ways connect what's happening in the news historically through the video. Um, I'll give you a quick example of, of one thing that uh, I've that I, I really treasure. Um, as a result of this project, I put every rabbi prayer that lives on video onto YouTube. Um, in 1994, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Maurice Lyons. Um, who opened the Senate in prayer, uh, and Rabbi Mar from St. Louis, and Rabbi Maurice Lyons uh, opened the prayer, put his hands over the Senate, and gave the priestly benediction, which many of you know is from Numbers, the oldest Jewish prayer uh, in the Torah, spoken in Hebrew. And I've been putting all this video on YouTube uh, mechanically uh, as part of the research. Well, a couple of weeks ago, actually about two or three months ago, um, Rabbi Maurice Lyons, who has since died, his family was marking, uh, was marking his yard site, his anniversary of his death, and the grandkids were Googling him and came upon this prayer that I had put onto YouTube. And they had never seen it before. They didn't know he prayed in, in the Senate. Uh, and I think, if I don't hope I don't get this wrong, but I think many of them never even heard his voice before. He had already died by the time his grandkids uh, came on the scene. So they, they sent me notes saying, this is amazing to see him in, in, uh, in, in the Senate praying I wrote back to them saying it's even more amazing for me as the guy who did this project to have this personal collection to have really come alive. Um, so that was Rabbi Maurice Lyons gave the prayer in 1994. That's a very particular example from this. I just love uh, teaching, you know, I'm of the age now where, you know, a lot of this current history, you kind of live through. C-SPAN began in 79. So a lot of my memories of being a political junkie uh, have come alive through these old videos. So there's always, just like those saying, there's a tweet for everything. There's there's almost a video for everything, and to be able to share that is, is one of the great joys. Howard, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to have you. We really enjoyed those presentations, and we will let folks know uh, how how to access them as well uh, after the event. I'm going to turn it over to our board co-chair, Todd Richmond. Well, thank you, Rachel, and thank you to the staff at DMFI, including one of my partners, Mark Melman, the president and CEO. I'm Todd Richmond, and I am proud to serve as co-chair of DMFI's Board of Directors, along with our other co-chair, Ann Lewis. Howard, thank you for that incredible presentation, and thanks for joining us, uh, speaking uh, videos and, and for your questions. Uh, we're deeply grateful that Howard was able to join us to help provide historical context and peace of mind in this moment uh, that we are all experiencing. And I can't wait to buy the book. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Everyone else could do the same thing. The link is in the chat, just so you know. And while DMFI has done a lot over the last couple of years, we have much more to do going forward with the Biden administration and our friends in Congress on critical issues such as Iran, USA to Israel, and building on Israeli normalization agreements with her neighbors. And being successful in those areas requires us to keep doing our work to ensure the Democratic Party remains strongly pro-Israel. And as Anne said, DMFI is the only organization focused on and dedicated to achieving that goal. But we cannot do this without your support and help from people who care about these issues as we all do. If you care about these issues and achieving those goals, then please join us in this work.
while you are in front of a screen. Go to dmfi.org to sign up for more information, get invitations to other programs, and of course, donate to us. If you want to learn more about DMFI and how you can get involved, you can reach out to us through the website or send us a note at info at dmfi.org. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Howard, thank you for such a wonderful presentation, and we hope to see everybody again soon. Stay safe.